good, good morning. Uh, let's get started um, to, um, to briefly, briefly introduce myself. I'm Nick Reddy with uh, Baylor Scott & White uh, Health. Uh, for those who don't know uh, much about us, we're a, a large, um, the, we're the largest uh, uh, healthcare system in the state of Texas. Uh, we primarily operate in Dallas and uh, Austin and I-35 corridor in between uh, in all of the cities. Um, like you would expect uh, any large healthcare system, uh, we have uh, several assets in our portfolio uh, that include uh, uh, about 40, 48 hospitals, uh, a few, uh, about 4,000 physicians that have about 600 clinics. Uh, we have a health plan and large, um, um, and large academic medical centers. Uh, research is a big part of what we do uh, in medical education. So, um, really, uh, what we wanted to talk about today was innovation uh, from from a vantage point uh, of where we sit and how uh, we in health system health system uh, look at that. Um, I think the world has changed uh, in the last uh, 10 years. Um, I think the data points are, are staring at us are pretty, pretty uh, amazing. Uh, we tell people it's so amazing how quickly the world has changed that we, we quit getting amaz amazed anymore. Um, you, know, uh, you know, the largest uh, taxi company doesn't own a taxi, right? The largest hotel company in the world doesn't own a room. Uh, the largest retailer doesn't own a store. Um, so the world's just changed. Uh, and if you think, finish the fourth sentence, will the largest healthcare system own a, own a hospital in the future, right? So, so that's really how we're thinking about the force of disruption and what, what it could mean to healthcare. There's really three things um, our system really wants to do around innovation. Um, one is um, make healthcare convenient. Um, Healthcare is a very inconvenient business. It's it's really really difficult to navigate to us. It's very uh, complex and confusing. Uh, it's grown over a period of several decades. Uh, so that's that's mission number one: make healthcare convenient. Um, mission number two: um, make it affordable. Um, we live in a business where you can't afford it without it, without uh, having an insurance company. Um, and so the question really is, can you make healthcare affordable in this country? Uh, and mission number three, which is the most noble part of what we do, uh, we're a not-for-profit organization. Um, 17,000 of our 40,000 employees are clinicians, nurses and physicians, and they have a very good soul. And uh, there's, there's one thing that drives all of us, it's, it's to keep people healthy. It's what we do. Um, um, so that, those are the three things we're trying to do. Convenience, affordability, and keep people healthy. Uh, what we do recognize in this journey is we can't do all of these things by ourselves, so we have to partner with uh, the best the country and the globe has to offer. So we partner enormously with the entrepreneurs um, that really help build a, a seamless ecosystem uh, in our mission. and. Uh, the the distinguished panel here represents some of those uh, some of those great ideas and great implementations. Uh, people that really understand uh, what it takes can, that can really help uh, move the needle and have great impact. So that's really who you, who you have here, and he'll spend the next uh, 45 minutes uh, answering a few questions, and uh, we'll leave the last 10 15 minutes for you guys to ask us questions. So uh, what I'll do is I'll ask the panel to introduce themselves uh, with Molly. Uh, good morning. I'm Molly O'Neill. I'm the Chief Commercial Officer for Proteus Digital Health. Um, I've been with Proteus two years, but I've spent the last 30 years uh, on the healthcare provider and delivery side. So I come at this not from just an entrepreneurial perspective, but how can we use, how can we use some of these really fascinating technologies to reinvent healthcare? So one of the things I wanted to start with this morning is, you know, if you think of this topic of um, can we embrace digital disruption uh, to reinvent healthcare, we have already invented digital disruption. I, I would uh, argue that three of the top high frequency events most of us in this room have probably already touched at some point today. Um, I have not, just because the chairman of my company is here, checked LinkedIn this morning. But, um, you know, 
when you're at an event like this and you, and you see the exciting changes that are taking place, that's another venue that is high frequency, a very low friction transaction for us to stay on top of just a tremendous amount of information about healthcare and, and transformation in general. Proteus, uh, as a technology, we believe is a platform for creating a digital on-ramp for a high frequency event that takes place every day in healthcare, and that's taking a medication. So um, one of the things I'd, I'd like to spend a few minutes on is explaining how the technology works, and then I believe that that will set up a framework for our broader discussion. Um, so uh, imagine taking a pill every morning that has a sensor in it that says on your digital device, good morning, you've just taken 10 milligrams of metformin, it's this time of day, and you've got two more to take today. Uh, in addition, share some uh, basic physiologic information, your activity, your rest for the last 24 hours, possibly the last week or the last month. And that information is going to go to the cloud where you've decided who you want to share the information with, whether that's a family member, a care team, or yourself. Um, and then your healthcare team has the opportunity through a portal to understand how you're traveling that day or the 99.9% .9 time that you spend outside of a physician's office. So we think this is um, a first step in taking a very high frequency event, removing the friction, and sharing that information with your care team. Uh, next slide, please. So. We're going to talk this afternoon uh, and this morning about what does it take for some of these solutions to become scalable. And there's been a fundamental um, sort of premise that we've used at Proteus, and that it all begins with life flow of the patient or the user. And many organizations, device companies, pharmaceutical companies, have done this historically backwards, where they've looked at the funds flow, is this a blockbuster drug or a device that's going to touch millions? Um, how do we get physicians to use it? And then, oh, by the way, does it work for a patient? But when we're talking about digital disruption, what we really care about is, um, is this important for an individual to want to use? Is it simple? Is it something that can be integrated into their daily routine? Does it provide insight so that it's actually relevant in the same way you would check your Facebook or your LinkedIn feed or you use Amazon as a commerce platform? And will it improve access and um, you know, provide a foundation of a deeper conversation that I can have with my care team so that I can move beyond anecdotal information and really share a digital nugget that is an exact um, indicator of, of what's happening to me outside the physician's office? So I'm going to leave it to, um, to John to sort of move us down, and I hope we'll come back and visit some of these topics. Thank you. I'm John O'Sullivan. I'm the uh, founder and CEO of PDAQ and the QCare mobile application platform. We uh, uh, follow a basic tenet in terms of healthcare and how to bring things into healthcare that make sense. And one of the tenets that we follow is the, uh, inter is the Institute for Healthcare Improvement's Triple AIM project, uh, which basically sets a foundation for three things to be accomplished in healthcare um, across the board, especially when inter introducing new processors or new, techno new technologies. One is how do you improve population health? How do you make people healthier? Um, another is how do you create a better experience for people by having uh, more access um, better education, just an overall better experience for people. And then the third is to how do you do this while reducing costs? Um, and, not, and these are all taken in, in conjunction with each other, not separated. Um, our, our application is a mobile application for accessing care, uh, either through a nurse triage or for house calls. Today in the market, what's very prevalent is uh, what everybody's heard about is virtual MD visits, and they're, they're everywhere. And they're great, um, but, the, but you have to ask yourself some questions. Number one, is that the first thing that should happen if somebody is sick? What's, what should somebody be able to tell everybody that, who gets sick? What's the first thing that you should do across demographics, different patient populations, different regions? What is the first thing that you should do? And most 
physicians or most hospitals have very different answers for a lot of different situations. And we believe there should be one answer for that situation. And then the other is, what, what are the other levels of digital innovation that should come along? Because we believe that you shouldn't access a physician if you have the sniffles or if you have a cold. Um, you know, there's a lot of training that goes into physicians. There's a lot of utilization of virtual um, visits. A lot of those really aren't necessary. Um, so we believe there's a front end of that that's, that's missing. We also believe there's a back end of that that's missing in terms of the ability to digitally bring care into the home with a, with a provider. And in other words, an, an old fashioned house call. Because there are certain situations where a virtual visit really doesn't work. Pediatrics is a really good example where a child can't explain what, how they feel, you know, they need somebody who's there. Geriatrics, post-acute care, multiple chronic conditions. These are all things where somebody needs a provider and how do we do that in a way that's lower cost. Uh, so from a nurse triage perspective, when you, people talk about nurse triage today, they talk about picking up a telephone and calling somebody. That sounds very 1980s to me. Um, and not very many people really use those very effectively because they don't get a lot of value out of it. Uh, we believe there's a great opportunity to be able to bring, um, again, better health care, more education at a lower cost by having nurses that are available digitally through your app where somebody, much the same way you would register for an, an Uber or something else, by doing that, the person that gets the information on the other end knows who you are, where you are, who your primary care physician is, what your children's names are, what kind of insurance you have, and the ability to connect with that person visually. Some people like text, we like visual or voice, we think it's more adaptive. But to be able to connect with that person and then really be able to triage that person to that next level of care, whether it's a virtual visit, a house call, or something elevated in a more traditional sense of urgent care center, uh, wait till the next day, so on and so forth. Um, so that's a very, very important missing piece that's in the, in the market, to, that's not in the market today. The other part of our platform is a house call and really bringing back a house call in those situations where it's needed. Um, one of the realities about house calls and our, and our recommendation when we work with health systems is to focus on after hours care because we believe primary care uh, should be with the primary care physician. It is the lowest cost, most effective point of care. We focus on after hours care where um, the alternatives are urgent care centers, very expensive ERs, or waiting until the next day. And the reality is, is that you can deliver a house call um, covered by insurance at a cost that's lower than an urgent care visit, certainly lower than ER visit, in a way that, again, meets those, uh, those needs. Um, a better education, providers tend to spend more time in the home educating the family, lower cost, um, and a much better consumer experience. So that's that's what our that's what our take is, and that's a, that's the approach we'll be looking at here. Hi, thank you. My name is uh, Oscar Salazar. I'm co-founder and CTO of Pager. Um, we started doing the on-demand uh, house call thing, uh, you know, a couple of years ago. Uh, we we've, we've done tens of thousands, mainly in New York. Uh, we quickly realized that uh, the main you know the main problem, well, one of the main problems in healthcare is. Uh, Patients, they don't really know what to do when they're sick. You know, um, most of the house calls we're, you know, um, offering are 90% um, uh, of the time were like just uh, peace of mind, uh, solving pretty much uh, questions pretty much, you know, like uh, we were a glorified kind of uh, WebMD. So we realized that there's a bigger problem in this industry. This is uh, you as a patient, you know, we are uh, going through a disease or sickness. We don't know what to do. Um, usually what we do is we go to WebMD, we type some symptoms, we find out that we're gonna die in two days, and, uh, and then we go to the ER, you know? Uh, so this is what we do as consumers. So, and we learned that, you know, tens of thousands of visits, a lot of data points, so we said, okay, you know, there's a bigger problem here, so let's switch. So Pager right now, it's um, chat-based, uh, AI power, um, pretty much uh, alternative to WebMD. It's a healthcare navigation system. You, uh, you're sick, you open the app. Um, we identify uh, intent using natural language processing. 
we have two main buckets, non-clinical and clinical. If it's non-clinical, a bot takes over the conversation and answers all your questions, co-pay, um, finding, you know, helping you find the closest doctor, you know, around you, um, uh, answering basic questions about your uh, insurance information or, you know, uh, helping you find a closest uh, urgent care clinic, you know, around you. If it's clinical, a nurse takes over the conversation, a physical nurse, not an artificial. I would love to be artificial, but, uh, you know, we're not there yet. So, um, a, a nurse is chatting with you. The AI takes over in a different way. Um, it gives the nurse superpowers. Pretty much based on the conversation, but it's telling the nurse, you know, based on the symptoms, you should trigger this protocol. I have, you know, have 99, you know, um, reliability, you know, that this protocol is uh, the best for the patient. The nurse triggers a protocol. We get into a decision tree. You, you know, we have, a, we have a knowledge graph that the nurse is actually navigating with the help of the, of the, of the AI. After the triage, you know, which is AI powered, um, nurse assisted, um, there's different buckets uh, of services we can actually provide. We can do the household thing, we can do the telemedicine thing, we can actually help you find the closest you know, ER, or we can just tell you, don't worry, you're gonna be okay, you know, you're not gonna die, just go and rest. Um, and we offer peace of mind. We have continuous care, you know, uh, next morning you get an automated message you know, to follow up, how, how you doing, based on your response, we trigger different events. So we created an ecosystem, pretty much a workflow, where a patient can actually interact with um, insurance companies and health systems in a very, very smooth way. We partner with health systems and insurance companies to offer that experience. Um, and this is pretty much what we do in Pager. Um, I love to be sitting here in this panel. Uh, I don't like you know, the word uh, disruption. I think disruption is the word that losers use. Yeah, um, you know, not the winners. Uh, if you embrace disruption, means that you are, it's too late for you. Uh, either you disrupt yourself, or um, you pretty much uh, evolve. I like evolution better. You know, health systems, healthcare. It's uh, it's very hard. It's very hard to disrupt. Um, usually, you know, two-sided marketplaces are easier to disrupt. I have a little bit of experience on that. Uh, Multi-sided. Um, you know, um, market, uh, which is, you know, the healthcare environment is, uh, is a little bit hard to disrupt, you know, so I'm very happy to be here with this, um, with these guys um, here, and, uh, you know, I think it's going to be a fun 45 minutes. Thank you um, very much. Uh, thank you, guys. O Oscar, let's, let's stay with you. I have a feeling you'll excite the crowd here. Uh, <laughs> um, can you, I think, um, I think that, uh, the, I think some of the people in the audience know um, you're one of the, uh, people who are part of the original team that founded Uber um, in New York and in San Francisco. Can you draw parallels yeah. between um, a non-healthcare uh, non healthcare business and bringing that to healthcare? What can you draw? What can you not draw? How is it yeah. going? If you don't mind going sort of, uh, why is healthcare unique different sort of? Yeah, uh, yeah, I built a pretty much you know, the original Uber system prototype, so it was like, Years ago, we launched in San Francisco. So I was in charge of designing the whole, the whole experience, you know, the process, um, also on the apps. So um, what is interesting is, uh, as I said, you know, uh, a two-sided marketplace is easier to disrupt. You know, you show me an industry that has a broker or an information keeper, and I'll, I'll show you a multi-billion dollar opportunity. So that's what it is. You know, this patch, taxi dispatch system was very, 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 um, artisanal, just put it this way. Uh, you know, it was one guy sitting in a room with a phone. You call this guy, you ask for a taxi. The guy, instead of locating the closest taxi to you, he called his best friend, you know, to give him, a, to give him you know, trips. That's, that's how the industry used to work. Just get rid of the broker and automate the whole process, and you just experience goes up. Unfortunately, you know, uh, healthcare, it's a little bit more complex than that. There's a bunch of state, you know, there's multiple stakeholders that you need to, you know, that you need to work with. Um, so this is pretty much, you know, um, so when, I, when people ask me, can you, can, can, can healthcare can be Uberized? I don't think so. I think pieces of healthcare could be, you know, uh, disrupting that way. You know, for example, logistics, you know, there's a lot of ambulances, you know, running around. It's one of, you know, the, that they have no GPS. They have no, I was, I was reading an article about 911, for example. Uh, 911 has a huge problem of um, geolocation. Uh, they have a, a very, very, very big, but you know, um, problem. You know, trying to locate victims. Um, 
which is crazy because every victim has a cell phone, you know, like less than three feet away from them. So, so this is, there's some pieces and some, some sort of, you know, um, problems in, in the healthcare industry that they could be changed, you know, with the right and smart use of technology. Healthcare as an industry is, I don't think it can be disrupted that way. Uh, what we're going to see, uh, and, I, and I, uh, it's you know, in the next five or ten years, is um, uh, th this is what I think. You know, I might be wrong, so don't you know, don't think I know everything because I know nothing about healthcare. <laughs> but um, but uh, but I see things that you know, uh, in, from the technology point of view, that um, then this is what I'm actually gonna, um, what, I, what I'm betting on. So I see a lot. Um, you know, there's big data, and I hate this word because it's been used for t for long, long time and hasn't delivered. Uh, but what we see is we have access to a lot of data. We have access to uh, mobile apps and mobile devices, um, we know, uh, you know, biometrics, um, all these you know, devices running around with accelerometers and all these sensors. We have also access to uh, artificial intelligence is becoming more um, democratized. You know? um, it's access to artificial intelligence algorithms, you know, like deep learning, uh, is just available and pervasive. So what I totally see in the next five to 10 years is in healthcare is um, the roles of uh, healthcare professionals are gonna change like dramatically. So for example, we're gonna see uh, AI uh, taking over um, parts of the decision making processes in, across the board uh, for diagnose, for triage, for um, clinical or non-clinical decision making. So I think this is the first wave that, I, that we're gonna see in healthcare. And this is the first wave of disruption, if you're gonna put, it, put a, a label on it. We're gonna see uh, AI giving humans superpowers in the healthcare space. The second wave is um, this bots, this AI, this data connectivity taking over the decision making process, not entirely, but importantly. And the third wave is, you know, I think 10 to 15 years, and this is something that I believe in, I think we're gonna see robots performing surgeries, like common surgeries, like appendicitis and stuff like that, you know, uh, in, in humans, you know, because it's something that, it's a machine you can train. Uh, it's, you can, it's, it's a task that is very repetitive. It's not, it's not very complex. Uh, and if you have accuracy and you have the data points, you can actually do that. So I think healthcare is gonna change gradually. Uh, but I think most importantly is processes within healthcare are going to be disrupted and are going to be changed with the use of tech, you know, new technologies and, 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 and availability of um, high performance um, uh, deep learning algorithms. So this is my vision and this is what I'm betting the future uh, of my company on. Um. Thank you, Oscar. Molly, let's, let's talk a little bit about what I call the micro and the macro issue in healthcare, which is it's relatively easy to have impact in a very small scale in healthcare. It's very few things in healthcare can scale. So what, what does it really take to bring um, disruptive technology to scale in healthcare? What, can you, in your experience, can you just talk through which, how you guys think through that problem? How are you guys jumping through hurdles? The hurdles are real. Um, I would say the, you know, this construct of life flow, workflow, funds flow is, is really a, an easy way to think about um, how you introduce a new technology into a healthcare environment and that may start in a single primary care clinic or a specialty clinic with a, a group of, a small group of patients where you can make a difference in terms of better insights, better outcomes, uh, potential to improve the return on investment for um, whoever that ultimate payer is, whether it's the health system itself or an insurance company. Um, we believe that the healthcare sales cycle is a very long one. So entrepreneurs that are contemplating using that channel as a way to get a regulated good into a patient's hands needs to be prepared for a long haul. Uh, Proteus has been in business for 12 years. Our FDA approved um, medical sensors uh, were approved in 2012. We have nine health system partners around the country right now, and if you've seen one health system, you've seen one health system. They all have their own unique cultures and personalities. I think there's some things that we've seen to be consistently true, and that is um, physician champions, 
somebody that really is invested in changing the way care is going to be delivered in their specialty area, in their clinic, for their unique patient population. Um, the, this is a change management process because we've taken that interaction between a physician and a patient down to, to minutes and sometimes less than 10. So the relevancy becomes very important. For me, uh, first and foremost, it's a clinical outcome. Did we improve the patient's care? Um, were we able to save time um, into getting to that information or that insight on the physician's behalf? Were they able to see more patients because of that? And at the end of the day or the month or the year, could they see an overall impact and positive clinical outcomes? With that comes reimbursement, and typically not until you have those things at scale. A reimbursement process is also a gauntlet, whether it's through the government, CMS, or through commercial payers. And to get something to scale, somebody's got to pay for it. Um, patients uh, should probably be the last in that cycle of payment. Um, many of the interventions that we're talking about provide tremendous convenience for patients and hopefully will um, save time for them to get on with other aspects of their life. But um, if the patient is doing the work, we need to make sure that we're incenting them to stay actively engaged. So once again, starting with life flow, is it easy, is it simple to use, is it valuable, workflow, um, is there clinical improvement? Where's the quality being derived? Is it measurable? Is it sustainable? Is there patient satisfaction and staff satisfaction in the process? How easily can this be adopted beyond a single setting? And then ultimately, when you scale this up, return on investment, the ability to demonstrate economic value, because uh, I think we all are mission driven, those driven to healthcare and technology to improve patient care, but at the end of the day, healthcare is expensive and some would say complicated. Um, and reimbursement has a way of uh, you know, showing a much clearer path to doing the right thing on a patient's behalf. Uh, thanks, Molly. John, uh, if you don't mind, uh, th you've, you've been extremely successful in, in the marketplace around driving consumer adoption. Which, which is very, very difficult. Can you talk about um, what I call the five-inch screen? How do you navigate users to use your mobile phone for services, which has been elusive in healthcare? Can you talk about sort of how you think about consumer adoption, your techniques, and sort of the future of consumerization in healthcare, please? Sure. So there's a lot of talk about technology and uh, bots and artificial intelligence, and those are all you know, really cool things that happen in the back end. But the, but the front end is consumerism. How do you get consumers to use something in a way that's gonna be very convenient, very easy, better than the alternatives that they have today? And in the app world, um, there's pretty basic tenets to that. It's gotta be very easy to use. It has to be uh, easy to register. Um, it's gotta deliver a service that is either um, more convenient or lower price, and you really have to have a wow factor when you use it, otherwise you won't use it again. Um, so consumer adoption for us is very, very important. Um, we, str and, then, and then the flip side is that you have to figure out how to make it that very easy within the healthcare system, because you have, uh, you're not ordering a pizza when you use an app for healthcare. You're ordering healthcare for somebody that you love, um, which means that you have to have a very high level of assurance about the quality, the trust associated with it. If you talk to your doctor, your doctor has to say, yes, that's a good thing. Uh, because unlike something like an Uber, you didn't have to ask your cab driver if they thought Uber was good. Uh, you didn't care what your cab driver thought, but you do care what your doctor thinks. Um, so, so consumerism is very, very important. Um, and how to create that adoption of something that's really actually very complex, but making it look very easy for the consumer. Um, in a way that will be very adaptable and very equitable in terms of being adaptable across a wide market. Because again, if we go back to the tenants that we work from on the triple M, it has to be equitable. It's got to improve population health. Um, it's got to be very accessible and has to be a, a better experience for both, not just the patient, but also for the provider. So we started out um, with, with that, we had a number of tenants, a number of approaches that we decided to start out with when we launched our service. We decided that we would launch our service within pediatrics. 
And pediatrics makes sense simply because if you think about a mom is at home, dad's traveling, she got three kids, one of them's sick, do they get in the car to go to the urgent care center, do they go to, go to the ER, they're gonna do something, um, but how can you deliver something better? Well, the first thing you wanna deliver is education, uh, because when somebody uses an app, again, I'll go back to Uber, you don't just use an app saying, I want a car. You know where you're going to go. You know what problem it is that you're going to solve. But in healthcare, when you use an app, when you're running access to your provider, you don't really know what problem it is that you're going to solve. You need somebody to interface with you to help answer some questions and help you make a decision on where to go. So we decided to launch in pediatrics because we knew there was a need. You know, kids get sick multiple times a year. For whatever reason, it's always on weekends or weeknights. Um, and there's a urgency from a parent in terms of getting, getting that care. Um, so that's what we decided to do. We did, a, we did our demonstration launch in North Texas, um, and we had, we, we had a very successful launch across the marketplace and very high adoption, and, and most importantly, we had very high patient satisfaction. Um, in addition to that, because it's a lower cost of care, we were able to get the managed care companies to provide uh, contracts. There are actually house call codes out there um, which are uh, less costly to the payer or to the employer than an urgent care center or the ER. So the managed care companies got on board as well. Um, and then with that, we were, start to, we were able to start to work with health systems. And the, re the reason we work with health systems is back to the issues of, of name brand, quality, trust, because again, you're not ordering pizza. Um, so that's really how we, we launched. Uh, uh, a lot of people look at us and say, oh, well, you do, you just do kids. Well, no, we start out with kids because we believe that's where you, you implement this ty type of technology. The other thing we recognize is that the female head of the household makes 90% of the decisions for the family. So uh, adoption within pediatrics, w once you get traction in a marketplace, you know, her, the husband who complains like a little baby and when they have the flu but won't go see a doctor, you know, mom has the ability to, to, to use an app to have a provider, uh, either a nurse through triage or a house call, take care of them. And then you, then you can extend into areas like geriatrics or acute care, post-acute care. All of these are places where uh, virtual MD visits aren't quite as, as uh, useful. Thanks, John. Um, Oscar, quick um, question for you around, um, around um, um, artificial intelligence. As, as you know, most of AI is very data intensive. It's mining enormous amount of data. How, how do you do that in a, in a world where uh, healthcare, is, as John was alluding to, it's not ordering pizza. It's, you really need to have a personalization for a human being. Uh, you really need to have empathy. So how do you create that? And as you know very well, markets are different. Uh, Pager launched in New York. Uh, but it can't just scale because there's, uh, you know, you kind of think global, act local sort of stuff. The local markets are very dominant. Uh, by the way, just Baylor Scott White, we operate in Dallas and Austin. They're just very different. Uh, people are more hip in Austin, right? So, um, uh, things of that nature. So, if you just mind talking about how do you bring empathy and personalization into the world of technology, which is usually relatively standardized? So, um, two things. Uh, healthcare, it's a uh, hyper-local uh, play. That's, uh, that's the number uh, one lesson we learn, you know, when we, when we launch. Is, uh, it, has, uh, it changes not only from state to state, but also city to city, you know. And, so, uh, and in, in some cases, like New York, like neighborhood to neighborhood, you know, because hospitals, they being in, for example, a hospital in the West Village, you know, they have different culture than the hospital, you know, in the Upper East Side. So this is super hyper-local, and it's, it, it makes, um, the whole uh, go-to-market strategy a little bit more complex. So that, uh, that I, uh, you know, 100% agree with, with, with Nick. Artificial intelligence, I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's overrated and I think it's underrated at the same time. It's overrated because people are worrying about robots killing us in the next five years. Uh, unless you, uh, uh, you know, uh, you give away AI to uh, the nuclear system in the U.S. and you know, program a heuristic kind of uh, list of rules, and then allow them to trigger all the attack. Yes, they're gonna kill us because you know they're not that smart. Uh, 
Um, artificial intelligence, as it is right now, uh, needs a lot of data. It's a statistical model, pretty much. You know, we need a lot of data and high quality data. We have a lot of data, but we don't have a lot of high quality data, especially in healthcare. Um, you know, one of the holy grails is claim data. Claim data, yeah, we have a lot of claim data, but a lot of the claim data is unstructured uh, and inaccurate. So, um, so, so uh, for you know, but I still think that artificial intelligence can be used in certain uh, pieces of the puzzle. So we have a lot of uh, data, image, for example, image data. You know, uh, for example, X-rays, for example, radiology, dermatology. You know, we have a lot of data of people taking pictures of moles. And we, and we know, you know, that it's very easy to identify if a mole uh, is cancer or not. We have, you know, five rules, uh, you know, whatever the number of rules is, but I think it's five. You know, uh, and then it's based on shape, it's based on color, it's based on, you know, on stuff that the computer can actually detect. So for dermatology, it makes a lot of sense, you know. Uh, uh, actually, right now, there's a couple of initiatives, you know, that they can actually, they're actually reviewing millions of pictures of moles and, uh, and performing accurate diagnosis. So for certain issues, for certain areas, I, I, totally, I totally see AI becoming, you know, a, an, interesting, um, an interesting tool. Empathy on the other side, we're humans, right? So empathy is what, uh, what makes us um, uh, a lo build a long-term relationship with whatever or whomever, you know? Uh, so I think empathy is the loyalty, is the key, is the key to, you know, for uh, loyalty, you know, to continue uh, using a service or, um, or to keep going, you know, in, in this. So empathy is going to be very hard to actually um, simulate, you know. We can simulate uh, intelligence or we can emulate intelligence. Empathy is what makes us humans. So that's why, you know, uh, Nick, in, um, in Pager, we always rely on a human on the other side of the equation. And what we do is we use, uh, it, it's, we call it, you know, augmented, augmented care. So augmented care uh, is, a, is a term that we pretty much um, came up with, and it's giving clinicians and medical professionals with amazing bedside manners superpowers. You know, uh, it's a better and faster diagno diagnose, better understanding of who the patient really is, because if you open our app, you are gonna know where you are, your demographics, your uh, historical, you know, your clinical data, can use also claim data if available. And we can actually paint a very good picture of who the patient is. So the human on the other side can connect better, interact better, and perform, you know, uh, provide a better user experience. So uh, just to, you know, to, uh, to close this, um, when people ask me, you know, coming back to artificial intelligence, people always ask me, are you afraid of artificial intelligence? And I will say that I'm more afraid of human stupidity. Uh, so you have to know when and, and you know when and where to use artificial intelligence um, in, in, in the whole ecosystem. I think it's totally overrated. I think it's a hype, you know. I th but I think that is going to be the future. So it's kind of contradictory. It's a term that uh, that uh, we're gonna hear in the next two years every single day. Uh, but I think if you ask me, one of what, which one, which industry is the one that you would bet your house on, you know, with artificial intelligence, I would say. Healthcare. So we are in the right space. We just need to implement, you know, uh, AI in the right way. Only when I when I think about Proteus. <laughs> um, inside joke. It's Proteus. Proteus. Still when there. I think of Proteus, <laughs> I have I have an ESL issue. I apologize. Uh, uh, when I think of Proteus, I think of the uh, the harmony between the triangulation of the basic blocks. Uh, genetics, the precision medicines one, uh, the atom and the material objects, and the byte and the digital, right? So I think of, I think of that triangulation, I see this technology as just really in the middle of those things and just one of the most amazing, amazing technological advances I've seen. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, sort of having something that's this powerful and how you sort of you know, progress that. I know you said we, we are, we're a 12 year old company and there's long runways with FDA regulations and um, health systems like us. We, you really have to embed that into our workflows and can't just say, here, I have a shiny object or a better mousetrap, go, go at it, right? Talk through how you penetrate the market with something 
to where I think most humans probably don't can't fathom what how interesting of a technology this is and how to apply it. Sure. So um, it Proteus the journey was really the journey through the FDA and uh, you know seven years to prove safety and uh, quality and that consumers from a human factors perspective would be able to manipulate this regardless of their age, their cognitive ability, um, and the state of their disease. So something as chronic and omnipresent as um, diabetes and hypertension, this is a great tool for helping people achieve their clinical goals of having their um, glucose under control or their blood pressure under control. For patients that might be struggling with a very um, expensive but curable disease like hepatitis C, there's amazing drugs out there today that if you take them every day for eight or 12 weeks, you will be cured. But if you miss a couple doses, you'll start over again. And it's $1,000 a pill. So the ability for people to reach that clinical goal of cure in some cases, like with hepatitis C, and do that in 12 weeks allows for thousands of other patients in a state Medicaid program to have access to that drug if you were able to take it efficiently. Our technology creates a digital object in that pill. So when you miss the pill, it says, hey, you forgot to take this today. Um, if you miss two, you might get a text, you might get a phone call from a nurse. If you miss three, we may have to call John and have a home care intervention um, that takes place that says, you know, what's going on? Did you not afford it? Did, could you not afford the pill? Did you have a side effect that we should be aware of? Did you lose them? Did you forget them? But at $1,000 a pill, that's a pretty expensive alternative. Um, the expense is having a liver transplant if you're not cured of your hepatitis C um, or living with the disease that gets in the way of working every day or um, you know prevents you from getting access to other health care that you may need and particularly people with this particular disease may have acquired it through different lifestyle behaviors um, IV drug abuse, mental health conditions, uh, just unsafe um, practices that this may be their on-ramp to the health system to actually get a much more holistic approach to their care. So taking this, you know, grain of sand and putting it inside a capsule with the drug that has a whisper-like signal that goes to a Band-Aid, goes to your smartphone, your iPad mini, the digital device of choice, goes to the cloud and allows your care team that you've empowered and given consent to, to support you in your journey. It's pretty powerful stuff. Uh, that's one example of a high cost disease. Our goal as a company would be to digitize the entire orange book, which is the list of all the drugs that have been approved by the FDA. And um, right now we have over 20 drugs and doses that are taken by over 90 million people a day. And um, these are the things that can show the highest impact. And we're really excited about working with health systems like Baylor, Scott and & White and, and others across the country that um, see this as not only a change in the workflow that is gonna make everybody more efficient, but it's gonna give a level of precision to the insight that you can make about what's going on with the patient. Um, and, you know, this is just the very beginning of a journey that I think is gonna take, you know, the next 10 to, to 15 years. So um, embracing digital today in the same way we have in other, every other area of our lives, it, the time is right for healthcare. Thank you. Uh, John, if you don't mind, uh, the last question for you before we take questions from the audience. Um, the, the world, I'm sure you would agree, the world is becoming more virtual. You know, I can, uh, any of us can click a button and FaceTime somebody in Malaysia right now, right? And, uh, you know, it's just, you know, there's just more things happening outside of our clinics and hospitals, more virtual health. Uh, you know, people people are just, just demanding, uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of an Uber-like service for everything. So my question to you really is, how, how do you balance the virtualization 
of healthcare versus some of the on-demand nurse triaging? How do you see that? Where do you see the balance happening in, in a few years, and how do you navigate that down that journey? So I think it's all a continuum, um, which is, again, part of the reason why we work with health systems is because they really are the best to manage that continuum of care, um, you know, from this time that somebody has a need. And our view is if you're across the population, if you have a need, there should be one answer. You know, use an app and talk to a nurse. Um, you know, some people have a, a, a text approach. We have a video approach. Um, but that's just part of the continuum of that care. More and more of that, more and more of that digital um, access to care will be able to provide us a much better ability to capture information, uh, capture information about patient populations, capture information about how to how to deal with people who are chronic users of ERs and have you know the best solutions for that. Um, so capturing data is going to be a big, big part of that digi digitalization and then being able to use care management better to utilize traditional resources in a much more effective way, especially the ER. Um, so, but it has to be easy. So for example, uh, you know, anybody in this room can go on the app store right now, download the QCare app, be registered in five minutes and two minutes later be talking to a nurse via uh, video. Um, it has to be that easy for consumers to adopt. Um, today, I love talking about data. I love talking about all the cool things that you can do in healthcare. But if um, the person living down the street from me can't use it today uh, in a way that's highly accessible for them, because they don't want to worry about all the stuff that's on the back end, they don't want to worry about the data, they don't want to worry about ED utilization or all of those things that hospitals have to worry with. They just want to get care, um, and they want to do it in a way that's very consistent and very high quality and very fast. Um, so we, we, we look at it as a continuum, and all of those pieces ultimately have to work together to bring a solution, not just in terms of solution provided to a market, but solution provided to different parts of the market that really need it. People who have you know, multiple chronic disease, people who are homebound, people um, who are high utilizers of the ER, um, all of those have to be addressed while keeping the three elements of triple aim in play. No, th thank you guys. Uh, sort of uh, what I would say to close it out before we take questions is we're, we're, we're very, very excited. Um, I, I tell our teams, uh, I can't think of, of a better time and a better place, um, you know, to operate under. Um, you know, th this, is, this is the perfect triangulation of healthcare in this country that needs to that needs to change. Uh, I'm sure most of you uh, see that, um, uh, whether it's on the political avenues or personally, you probably have gone through some healthcare experiences that make you wonder why it's not different. So uh, it's a it's a it's a perfect uh, time from that perspective. Uh, I think you see from from our partners here, technology is pretty amazing. Um, you know, the, the art of possible um, is, is what we think. The only limitation is human vision. The reality is, if you can think it, it's possible. Uh, American entrepreneurs are pretty amazing, like the ones on the table. They, 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 they can do a lot of things. So we're pretty excited about having, um, having the impetus to change, having the capability and skill set um, in, in the marketplace. And finally, and most importantly, um, uh, I think systems like ours, having the will um, and, and, and the determination to change, because as you can imagine, um, that's not how we were built for the last 100 years. We were, we were built to manage risk and take care of the millions of people that come to us uh, in a safe fashion. Uh, so uh, for us to move at speed, it, it creates pause, right? Because we have to do it carefully, uh, because we're dealing with humans. Um, so. So I think those, the, that those three things exist in the triangulation, and we're pretty excited. Can't think of a better time, um, you know, to be operating and uh, feel like we're climbing Mount Everest, but, uh, uh, but pretty excited about it. So we'll take questions from the audience, please. Name Autobach. Um, we create prosthetic limbs for amputees and we create uh, mobility devices for children with cerebral palsy and things like this. So, you know, you guys are talking a lot about pharmaceuticals. 
Um, our devices also require a prescription. So how do you see you know, this kind of technology maybe integrating with things like medical device? So um, that's a great question. We are actually a 510K medical device and also require a prescription. I think the process is very similar. It's change management for the care team and thinking about things in a different way and you've got to partner with them, um, you know, and find those opinion leaders within the organization and then people, you know, it's really concentric circles. It's, you know, speaking about it regionally, state medical societies, moving it to the professional societies as well, that this is better for the patient. I think, you know, table stakes, the technology getting through the FDA, having an approval, that's great, but it really has to work for the patient and the care team. So um, putting the energy there, I think, is, is probably the most important first step. But I think this all applies to devices as well. Thanks, Melissa. Hi, um, Keith Toussaint. I uh, consult in this uh, sort of overall space. I uh, had a lot of experience working in healthcare organizations and uh, driving innovation activities, to be just brief about it. Um, uh, I want to piggyback on something you mentioned, Oscar, on, uh, related to the um, sort of multifaceted and multi-sided nature of delivering solutions in healthcare. Um, I'm going to make an assertion, and I'm going to ask a question, a question based on that assertion. If you think the assertion is false, I want to know why you think it's false. If you think the assertion is true, I want you to answer the question. Mm -hmm. So um, the assertion is in order to enable the holistic sort of a comprehensive care that drives to the triple aim, and as a sidebar, I'd argue we should be, we should be talking about the quadruple aim now, including the experience of clinicians. Um, foundational to that is the ability to aggregate relevant information, not just about the patient, but about the nature of care in the context of the clinical pathways, the, the workflows, et cetera. And our, the assertion is our current environment in which, in which the health information is, is managed, used, curated, et cetera, is qualitatively incapable of doing that. And I'm gonna assert it's largely because of siloed stovepipe applications and services. That's my assertion. If you disagree with that, I wanna know why. So if, if that is true, I wanna know what each of you is doing to address breaking down those silos. And I don't mean just getting more just sort of eyeballs on your app, but I mean genuinely going to the root of that problem and, and helping us all fix it. Oscar, he took you by name, so I think you... <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. I think one of the biggest problems uh, in healthcare is, um, infor you know, uh, is the lack of uh, information. Uh, nobody's sharing the information, you know, which is crazy. Even, you know, you as a patient, you go uh, to the hospital in Texas and then uh, go back to New York, you know, the way they share the information. If they share it, it's just crazy. Some people, some hospitals are just faxing the information. Some hospitals are using CDs. I don't even know how to read a CD if I go one. So just insane. Uh, so the information sharing is, a, is one of the biggest problems, you know, in this industry. I, I absolutely agree with that. So uh, our company, how are we going to solve this? I don't think there's a the silver bullet, you know, to solve it, you know, on a day, but what we can actually do is we can actually, um, all this backend stuff that nobody sees is very important in healthcare, you know? Uh, so you, you have two sides. You have the patient side, which is very important uh, for engagement, but then you have the backend, which is what nobody wants to see and nobody wants to even touch it. I, I just love that stuff because I'm crazy. I just love the sexy piece of the business. So interconnecting with systems, you know, we're building technology to interconnect with, uh, with the healthcare, um, you know, uh, health systems and, 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 and payers to get access to their data. And not only get access to the data, but also to treat the data and make it readable, make it, uh, you know, also make it um, accessible from anywhere to every single provider that is uh, participating. So what we're building is an ecosystem uh, where we can actually uh, move the data around and present the data in the right way to the right decision maker. Um, again, is this gonna solve the, the, the information problem in the healthcare industry? Absolutely not, but it's a good start. So if companies like us, is, you know, or like any company that is in, in, this, in this panel, 
can actually start creating value from all this information you know, that is being uh, stored in silos. And we can actually uh, apply some pressure, you know, to EHR companies and all this, you know, uh, all these manufacturers that are there, you know, and they're creating closed systems. I think we're going to get there, and I think it's changing. Epic, for example, is it's uh, it's already working on APIs, like actually APIs that work, not APIs that doesn't. So so API API, API APIs and and also. Um, Enabling access, you know, to uh, to their to their data. So I think, you know, uh, AI somehow also is going to help that because if we want to really use AI, we need data. So I think the ecosystem is aligning, you know, towards that goal. And I think uh, our our goal as uh, players in this in the, in this game is to demand um, better access to data. And once we have it, we need to share it. With our fellow, so I was talking to Nick, you know, and one of the, uh, uh, and we all agreed that in healthcare we need to partner. We cannot every single company, you know, every startup, every every health system, every payer, we need to partner. If we want to disrupt healthcare as a whole, the only way to do it is by establishing partnership and collaboration and sustainable models. So that, that would be my yeah, I've, I've been in healthcare for a long time, worked for a lot of physician practices. There's a thousand EHR practices out there. Yeah. And physicians don't like putting in EHR practices. And they definitely don't like giving access to their practices to the hospital who they think might do something really bad to them. So there's a, there's, there, unfortunately for independent physician practices, what that means is that over a course of time, as technology really becomes part of the solution to providing care, it will drive independent physician practices towards affiliation with health systems who have the wherewithal and the scope to be able to plug them, provide them the EHR systems, plug them into their system so that that data is truly transferable from the primary care doctor to the orthopedic surgeon to the cardiologist because with it, without that um, that transferability, you're always going to get that 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 fax that's coming to your office today. And unfortunately, that's the way data gets to most physician practices is via fax, which is crazy, but that's where we are today. So I think it's at a macro level, it's a behavioral economics question. Um, you know, humans usually do what what you know their incentives are, and if you look at the healthcare, the major healthcare players, there's providers, there's payers, and there's pharmaceuticals. And the question I think we have to ask is, do they have one incentive that all three of them are marching towards? Uh, if you do, then information, like whether it's between a physician or a hospital, whatever it is, uh, there's just business, different businesses that have their own incentives. I think shared incentives of behavioral economics will help, uh, because as, as John was alluding to, uh, if you don't trust the other person, it's very difficult to trust them with your data. Uh, so I think uh, it's a conversation of collaboration and partnerships like Oscar's mentioned. Uh, I, I, I hate to say this, this is not a political statement. It, uh, other countries have solved this through public policy. Uh, this is not putting four people in the room and say, hold hands and saying kumbaya. Uh, we've done that for 30 years, it doesn't work that well. Um, uh, globally, this has been a public policy mandate to, to share information, but the technology highway in healthcare is uh, poor, uh, and you can't get from one city to another city, and it, it causes problems. So, next question. I hear kumbaya and sing louder, but I think you're all very naive. Kumbaya, let's sing it louder. We've been singing it for 30 years. Nobody, everybody knows what the problem is. Nothing's done about it. I'll tell you here in a few seconds why. And then I'll give you the civil bullet for what you and others can do about it. How neat would that be? Okay. So here's the deal. I hear here that the epic, oh my goodness, they're gonna put IP, they're gonna do this and loosen up and Cerner's gonna loosen up. They've been doing this for years, fighting each other for those accounts on an exclusive basis for years. If you got epic, we won't let you in. If you got Cerner, we won't let you in. Now you somehow believe that the two of them are gonna to work together to figure out how to destroy both their business models in favor of what you're doing? Keep dreaming, because they and others are spending $500 million here in Washington to keep the system like it is. The folks on that side don't wanna fix it. It was fixable years ago. I had fixes years ago. If it, all the people, the information would work together, we wouldn't have this problem of interoperability, would we? We've got a $10 million a year institute in Nashville trying to solve for interoperability. 
to make people who haven't been willing for years to talk to each other, to talk to each other. And you're not going to be able to do that by persuasion. You're going to have to take that from their clinging, dead hands, which is what I'm dedicated to doing after being 50 years in healthcare. So the silver bullet is individuals have to have this information. It has to be theirs to own. They own the right to it now. The federal government says everybody's got to give that stuff to people. But like you say, call a hospital, get a fax. Call a doctor's office, we send it to Iron Mountain. Call Epic and they say, Cerner chewed it up so before you made a good decision, spent 50 million for us to chew it up and not give it to you another way. I'm telling you what the truth is. So the truth is, if physicians would get together and say, we are at the center of all these decisions about how people are treated, protocol, use of evidence, et cetera, et cetera, and you take the payment away from it. The reason it won't work now is because of the payment system. As long as it's paid for the way it is, it's going to keep doing what it's doing. We don't have a broken system. We have a beautifully operating healthcare system. I made hundreds of millions of dollars down it over the last 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 50 years. So I know. Works well. Worked well for me. Works well for billionaires in the insurance and hospital business. Doesn't work so well for the guy on the street. So if we can get the person engaged in saying, I want to own this, and I want willing to be part of a movement to demand that I get my information from all those sources. I'm not waiting for Epic and Turner to talk. I'm not waiting for Phillips and GE to talk. Give it to me. Let me act on it now, and then I, with my representative, will tell you how we want to use it and what we want for you. I put that little grain of sand in here so we can diagnose everything for ourselves. We don't need your diagnosis. We have the capability now with the technology we have now to diagnose it ourselves. So let me diagnose it. And then with my helpers, I'll give a megaphone to millions of people to turn that around and say, here's what we need to buy. Here's where we want to buy it. Here's what we want to pay for it. Here's how we want to deliver it. And you don't have to be told, go to the doctor, go to the specialist, go to the hospital, get the surgery, go into rehab, and repeat until you're dead. It doesn't have to be that way. But that's the way it is now. Repeat until you're dead. To the healthcare system, the only bad person is a dead person. If you're an alive person from in NICU to this corporate ICU, the family won't yeah. let you pull yeah. the tubes all the way between yeah. there. Yeah. That's my little deal. No. So there's a silver bullet, then the problem it won't be solved the way you yeah. guys and others are going about it now. Thank you. Thank you. Much. Go ahead. <laughs> Wait, wait, what are you going to say? No. I'm quite curious about the topic of partnerships, how you balance being reactive to what the market is developing for you and how you also seek partners to solve what you want to solve. Uh, it's, a, it's a good balance. And, and the quick 30-second answer is this. I think it's important for companies like us to first be sincere. Um, Number one, we really ha want to do what we want to do. If we're not sincere, it doesn't work. Second, we have to have a, a good amount of well thought out strategy. So, if, so we have to really know what we want to do. Uh, here's what we want to do. And then we usually look at the market. Um, if we look at the market, next thing I know I'll be with like 6,000 different entrepreneurs in the country in California and Boston and Israel and wherever else the tech hubs are, Austin. So we like to really know here's what we want to do and who can help us get there. Um, so that's really how we, uh, we uh, decide between the signal and the noise. Um, so we have a very strong strategy, a very, very strong perspective on which pieces of the puzzle we need to orchestrate our ecosystem. And those are the partners we work with. And that's really how we, how we partner, if that makes sense. So, so. John, I have a quick question about provider training. Uh, going to a remote assessment and remote delivery of care seems to be a skill that is not routinely covered, if at all, in any sort of training. How are you doing? How are you working with your providers to give them those skills that they need? I'm sorry, you're, you're talking about the managed care reimbursement. I, I'm talking about if you're if you're asking someone to remotely assess uh, a patient and to determine a care. So, so in terms of the remote, the, the, the care navigation, the nurse triage, 
we rely on um, trained nurses who follow standard protocols um, to assess the situation. They're not diagnosing, and treating, or prescribing because they're nurses. What they're, if there's some, some recommendations they can give them uh, to take care of the home, that's what they do. But what they really are doing is taking the information that they're able to gather through the digital technology about the patient, who they are, where they are, who their primary care doctor is, um, other information, being able to pull up their medical record um, based upon having been seen before, and being able to really navigate care. And that's really the key. On that side, the care navigation is really the, the key element because if you look at statistics in terms of you know, how ERs are improperly utilized or you know, the, um, you know, things that don't really need to go to an urgent care center that can wait till the next day, it's really about managing that and educating the consumer a lot more. As far as the care that goes in the home on a, on a house call, uh, we use primarily nurse practitioners or mid-level providers because it doesn't make sense to do that with a physician economically. Um, most, uh, we use obviously those who are well-trained and experienced, and when they go into the home and, and do care, they're conducting an office visit just as they would uh, in the office, but the reality is they're typically fairly low acuity things, so it's not very complex. Uh, issues. Thank you guys. I'm, I'm getting dirty looks and dirty signs. Well, so, um, we'll, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.